don't hold the same standard. Um, I've, I've heard men in other cultures say they like women with a little meat on their bones. Well, our standard seems to be a little different than that. We're always trying to thin ourselves down, men and women, that the standard is if you don't have a six pack, you're just not a good looking guy. Well, you don't know how many packs I have, but I tell you, I got at least one. <laughs> got at least one. Um, we become a consumer culture. That's because of our times and our culture. Um, prior to the 1800s, people weren't consuming. They didn't go to the store and buy whatever they wanted. So that's changed. Did you know that when the pilgrims landed and Christmas time came around, they thought it, it was an abomination to celebrate Christmas. They considered it because over in England it became a party time, it became a drunken feast. So if you were a Christian, if you were one of the pilgrims, um, you didn't celebrate Christmas. Well, obviously that's changed for us. As Christians, we all celebrate Christmas. We even decorate. We even put trees inside the church building. They would have thought that was anathema back then, that we're up and godly. So we have to understand that we are part of the times and the culture that we live in. And with that thought in mind, one of the things that we do today that they didn't do back then is we run around and we say, are you ready for the holidays? Are you ready for Christmas? And what do we mean by that? We mean, are you done shopping for gifts and for food? That's what we mean. Are you ready? Yeah. People, I, uh, people must have asked me that question at least 10 times so far this year. And I say, yes, my wife has finished our shopping. <laughs> and she's ready, and I'm ready because I bought her the gift, and she bought all the other gifts. She's my helpmate. So the question we want to ask ourselves today is, not, are you ready for this Christmas? Are you ready for Jesus' birth that happened 2,000 years ago and celebrating that? But we want to get into, not only did he come the first time, but he's coming again a second time. Are you ready for that? And it's not going to involve decorations and buying food. It's going to involve our hearts. So that's what I want to kind of hit on today. One pastor entitled the idea of the first coming or Christmas, he entitled his sermon, Happy Incarnation. And I thought about that, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if as Christians we just started this trend where instead of saying Merry Christmas, or Happy Christmas as they say in England, if we just started saying, hey, Happy Incarnation. And people would say, what are you talking about? Well. Christmas is the birth of Christ. It's a birthday celebration. And he came, God came into the world. And that's the doctrine of the incarnation. So, happy incarnation. Next week, it'll be great. So, uh, his first coming, really, in short, is this. Because we become so used to the narratives of the Bible, Matthew chapter 2, Luke chapter 2 through 4, somewhere in there, um, is the story of the wise men in Matthew, Mary uh, giving birth in Luke. We become so used to the story that it kind of just, it's the same old, same old. So if I preach a, a Christmas message, like I've been trying to do the whole month as I do every year, focus on Christ, so next Sunday, obviously, Sunday morning and Sunday night, we're going to be hitting two particular places in the Bible. The Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke. And you think to yourself after a time, it's kind of like the Christmas songs we sing. We only sing them once a year, but we've been singing them our whole life. We just get used to them. Oh yeah, joy to the world. You know, oh come, oh come, Emmanuel. And, it, and we get to a point where it becomes 
Well, where we lose the wonder of it all, where we lose the reality that God became one of us and grew as one of us, lived with siblings as most of us do, lived in a family unit, as Mike mentioned Sunday school this morning, what would it be like to live with a sibling who never sinned? Well, I can tell you what it'd be like. You'd be taunted. You'd be tempted, I suppose. Come on, come on, throw the rock, throw the rock. And I think it would be difficult. You see, for the kids that grow up today, that are mocked or ostracized because they don't look like everybody else, they don't act like everybody else. Jesus understands that. For every kid that is marginalized in this world, Jesus understands that. He grew up as a child that was marginalized. Not only did his siblings probably think he was strange or knew he was strange, so did all the kids in the neighborhood, in Nazareth, Oh, that, that Jesus, that Yeshua, he never does anything that we like to do. Well, as kids, they probably like to get in mischief. Jesus didn't do that. So for every child in this world that's lonely, that goes on social media and people are saying horrible things about you, and I don't know why kids keep reading it, they should just get off social media, but they do and it affects themselves. It affects their ego. It affects everything about them. It affects their psyche. And we have children today that literally commit suicide because of what other kids are saying to them and about them. Being bullied. Being mocked. Being marginalized. Jesus understands that. We gotta get those kids to Jesus. He understands that. So uh, all I want to say today is this. Let's not lose the wonder of it all. Let's, let's not forget that we're celebrating on Christmas morning not the idea that we all get to get gifts, but that the gifts represent the greatest gift of all, that Jesus came into the world for us. Charles Spurgeon said this. I like Charles Spurgeon. Great preacher of the 1800s. Had the first mega church and no contemporary music. Can you imagine that? A mega church with no contemporary music. He said, the, the, uh, and I'm quoting him, the incarnation is forever to be admired. Let us bow our heads in reverence Whenever we speak of it, for Jesus became man and bore our likeness in order that he might save us. Simple truth that we all know. But I'm here to remind us. C.S. Lewis, God became man to turn creatures into sons, not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. That's us, men and women. We're new kind. We're we're different. We're born again. Our motives are different. Our thinking ought to be different. Our heart should be different. Everything about us is new. I know it's certainly true in my case. Am I perfect? Well, <laughs> I'm working towards it. I'm working towards it. Gregory of Nicaea, old the old church father. Jesus came down from his lofty throne to the Lord of glory, not in dazzling show and majesty, but robed in humility as the lowest of the low. He became son of man who was son of God. He became son of God who was son of man. To the end that being made one with him, we might be able to be made one with God. Hmm. You know, before Jesus came into the world, how did God reveal himself? Two ways, through his word and through the world. So we looked at the world and we said, wow, 
whoever created this world gave us everything we need to survive and to thrive. In fact, in his word, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. I love the fact that the James Webb Telescope has reached so deep into space that now they're saying the galaxies are fully formed 13 billion years ago, because that's how old they believe the universe to be, and they don't understand why. Something's wrong with their philosophy of how the universe formed, how it came to be. And all I keep thinking of is, in the past 100 years, we used to think the galaxy, well, first we used to think the stars that we see was the whole universe. Then we realized, no, the galaxy is the whole universe. And then they came to realize, no more than 75 years ago, that, oh, no, our galaxy is just one galaxy among many galaxies. And now we realize that there are literally billions of galaxies. The point I'm making is this. The, he the bigger the heavens get, to us, the bigger we come to realize how big it is, that's how big God is. God just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. He's infinite. You want a picture of infinite? Look into the heavens. It's infinite. It just goes on forever. If they invent a bigger telescope, you know what they'll see? More galaxies. They'll never get to the point where there's just this big bang, they'll never do it. Because God did not create the world through evolution. He created the world with the spoken word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. He created the earth first. And on day four, he created the stars, the sun, the moon, and the stars. So completely different than evolution. So. His first coming. But I want to talk to you not only about his first coming, as I did, but his second coming as well. Because Jesus died on the cross, as you know, rose again the third day, dwelt with the disciples mostly for the next 40 days, and then ascended into heaven with his promise that he's coming back again. On um, that day, I will be Pentecostal enough to jump up and down and sing and shout, dance down the aisle, dance, climb up the walls. I mean, no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more death. Annie was buried yesterday. I never went to a, a viewing that was so crowded on Friday night. Oh my word, it took an hour and three quarters to go up through the line to the family. Hour and three quarters. And we thought we'll get there early <laughs> and, beat, and beat the crowd. Well, that didn't happen. I'm not even sure if the, the people, did you stay the whole time? I stayed at the Dome of Souls tent. I, that, that's what I was saying to Pat. They, they, they couldn't just, you know, Okay, it, it's, it was three to seven. Okay, it's seven, everybody go home now. No, you have to see everybody. So it lasts till, till 10 o'clock. So I'm almost 10, and it was taking three hours towards the end. Three hours towards the end, because those people didn't get there early. <laughs> three hours. There won't be any more of that. There won't be any lovely 30-year-old girls who literally fought for her life for 30 years um, and passed away. Won't be any more of that. It's going to be awesome. Awesome. Harold Camping, I don't know if you recognize that name, but Harold Camping, in, he, he predicted that May 21st, 2011, Jesus would come back. Was he right or wrong? Wrong. In the fourth century, a Christian writer, his name is Lactinius, determined that Jesus would return in the year 520. Was he right or wrong? When the year 1000 was rolling around, 
Many believed Jesus would return. So they stayed up all night, New Year's Eve, 999. Were they right or wrong? Yeah. Some of the Anabaptists, that's our life's blood, Anabaptist, that means to be baptized. We believe that. If you're baptized as a non-believer or baptized as an infant, when you come to Christ, you're baptized again. But there were some Anabaptists who believed Christ would come in the year 1533, which is exactly 1,500 years after the death of Christ. Were they right or wrong? Bishop Usher, now he's the one that came up with the common dates we use in our Bibles. So the creation happened like 6,000, uh, 6006, I think, uh, if you have the dates, his dates in your Bible, uh, BC for the creation. Um, and so we generally use his date. But he believed that the Lord would come back uh, in the year 1644. Was he right or wrong? George Rapp. This George does not rap. But George Rapp, a religious teacher in Pennsylvania, predicted that Christ would come back on September 15, 1829. Was he right or wrong? Wrong. William Miller, um, they later became known as the Millerites, and, and thus was birthed from the Millerites, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He caused widespread panic throughout America by announcing October 22nd, 1844 is when Jesus is coming back. Was it right or wrong? It was wrong. In the 1980s, somebody wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Would Return or the Rapture Would Happen in 1988. Was he right or wrong? He was wrong, but he corrected himself and he came out with the second edition why Jesus would come back in 1989. Was he right the second time? No. I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 24 with me. And I'm going to show you from the Bible, from the Bible, when Jesus is coming back. And you know, if we're looking at the Bible, it can't be wrong, right? <coughs> Matthew chapter 24. Now, the disciples had just asked Jesus a question, two questions, actually. So if we go down to uh, uh, verse 1, Jesus went out from the temple, that is, departed from the temple, and the disciples came to him. To show the buildings of the temple. Why? Well, because um, Herod would, was uh, reconstructing the temple. He enlarged the, the courtyard. He actually built a retaining wall and filled it in and uh, made the temple um, court uh, larger. In fact, the wall, the wailing wall, is not part of the temple proper. It's actually uh, part of the retaining wall that held the temple. So uh, the disciples, the construction was coming to a completion by this point in time. And they were just kind of saying, just all look at this building. This is awesome. And this is what Jesus said. In verse number two, Jesus said to them, see you not all these things, truly I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Oh, well, that doesn't sound like a happy thing. And it wasn't. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and he left the city, went through the Kidron Valley under, uh, on the mount, uh, looking out at the city, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? In other words, when are those stones going to be torn down? And here's their second question. And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus said to them, answering the first question, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. Now, he gives all these signs, and we won't go into it, but that's not our point here today. 
He gives them all these signs. Here's what's going to take place when the temple is going to be torn down and the city of Jerusalem destroyed. If you recall, earlier he wept over the city. And he said, I, I would have gathered you like a, like a hen gathers her chicks, but you just wouldn't come. And he wept over the city. Why? Because he knew the time was coming when the city would be destroyed. And he gives all these signs, but if we drop down to verse number 36, now he's giving the answer to the second question. When are you coming? When's the end of the age? But of that day, an hour knows what? No man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only, even he didn't know. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, what were the days of Noah? Well, we know that violence filled the world because it says so in Genesis, but also for the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. In other words, life was going on as usual. Now, if you read the signs of the destruction of Jerusalem in the beginning of the chapter, there's no way life is going on as usual, per se, because there are earthquakes and wars and... Uh, He's telling the, the believers, listen, when you see the, the city encompassed about with the armies, flee to the mountains. That's not life as usual. But Jesus said, listen, nobody knows when I'm coming. Nobody knows. Life will be going on as usual. People will be marrying, eating, drinking, doing the normal things in life. And then he will come. So, they didn't know, in verse 39, until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also be the coming of the Son of Man be. Two will be in the field, one shall be taken, and the other left. Two will be grinding in the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you don't know what hour the Lord does come. So we know this, that he's coming, but drop down to verse 44. Therefore be also what? Ready. Ready. So that's the question, are you ready for the coming of the Lord? When I was a kid, not too long ago, isn't it weird how you're the same on the inside, but the body just keeps getting older? As the Bible says, we're renewed day by day. Spiritually, renewed day by day, growing in grace, becoming better people, more loving, more uh, compassionate towards others, more helpful. Um, more understanding as it ought to be. So as we grow older, we become, we ought to be better people, but spiritually speaking, we ought to be more Christ-like. But as a kid, I don't know if any of you remember these cartoons. Remember Looney Tunes <coughs> cartoons? Daffy Duck and Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny? Those were the good cartoons. But there was one that I watched as a kid, and that was uh, Popeye the Sailor Man. Anybody remember him? And uh, his, his sometimes friend and many times rival, uh, Blue Dog. Remember him? Big, big guy. And then, of course, they both, uh, they both liked olive oil. Olive oil. Um, and then there was a guy, Whippy, that ate the hamburgers all the time. And then there was a little sweet pea. And so I, I watched that cartoon. And I recall one time as a small kid, um, I was probably 35 watching that. And I, I, just, I threw it in because there's still guys in their 30s that are home watching cartoons. Um, and when that cartoon was done, I had to go to bed. I don't recall exactly the age, I don't know, four or five, somewhere in here. And I remember one time finally realizing that I'm going to bed and it's still light outside. I, rem I remember that thought of running through my mind as a kid. It was like, I'm going to bed and it's still light. Well, obviously it was summertime, but uh, I'm going to bed. And I think it was 6.30. So my parents wanted to make sure I was out of their way early. <laughs> at 6.30. Um, now, they used to have a friend who actually got movies, 16-millimeter 
movie films, like real movies. And he set up the projector, and one night I said, well, because I'm awake, I'm laying in bed. And I hear he comes over, he sets up the projector, and the movie starts. And I go out to the living room. And they're watching a movie called, uh, I think it was Bluebeard, Bluebeard the Pirate. And, and I remember at the end of the film, and I, I love swashbuckling films to this day, um, you know, Errol Flynn, all that stuff. And at the end of the movie, they took the bad guy, Bluebeard the Pirate, and they buried him in the sand at the edge of the ocean up to his neck. So just his head was sticking out in the sand with the tide coming in. Now, I don't know about you, but as a four or five year old kid, that guy, I, I can still picture that poor guy. And I'm thinking, is anybody gonna get that guy out? But Popeye, getting back to Popeye. So all the Popeye cartoons were the same. He gets, in a, a mess or a fix, and he's losing the battle, whether it's against uh, Bluto, usually, or something else happening. And he reaches into his vest pocket, right, and what's he pull out? <laughs> a can of spinach. A can of spinach. And he gulps it down, and immediately, don't you love Popeye too? His forearms are three times bigger than his biceps and his triceps. And he's got the strength he needs. Well, let's think about this for a second. Wouldn't it be better for Popeye to have regular balanced meals, including spinach, so that he was always ready? <laughs> Not just in an emergency he had to get ready. There's a lot of Christians like that. They're lazy. Not really reading your Bible not being faithful in prayer until an emergency happens. And Bluto the devil comes. And there's a crisis in their life and suddenly what are, what are they doing? They're praying. They're taking out their can of spinach and saying, oh Lord, you know, I, no, we should always be ready. Amen. Always be in a spirit of prayer. Not that you have to necessarily close your eyes. And I, I was praying uh, with somebody, oh, Paulina. I said, Paulina, are you driving? She said, yes. I said, well, don't close your eyes as I pray. <laughs> I'll close my eyes. You keep your ears open. But Jesus told us, be ready, because you don't know the day. Now, I know we live in this culture and this time, and we got it all figured out. The signs are all around us. Obviously, Jesus is coming back soon. It's evident. Can I just remind you again? All through church history, 520, 1533, 1829, 1844, those are just the ones written down, and every other one in between that we don't know about, they all believe it's coming back in their time as well. You say, but pastor, I mean, we have the technology now. Yeah, and they'll have the technology a thousand years from now. Jesus doesn't come back for that long. Let's just always be ready for the Lord. So let's talk about a few things. What do we need to do to get ready? Well, number one is this. You need to receive Christ for salvation. That's number one. So for all the people that think everybody goes to heaven and only Hitler goes to hell, they are sadly mistaken. People need to trust what Christ has done for them on the cross. First John, first John, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, As many as received him, to them he gave the power and the authority to become the sons of God. We have to receive Christ and his sacrifice on our behalf. And then I was thinking this. As Christians, so if you're not a Christian, you need to become a Christian, a follower of Christ. 
Number two is this. As Christians, is there any unconfessed sin in your life? Are you living with something on your heart and your mind? Is the Spirit of God convicting you of something that you need to repent of, change, get rid of, or add to your life? We need to do that. Psalm 5110, there's all the Spirit now. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a, a right spirit within me. That's David's psalm of repentance. When he committed adultery, we're going to talk about that tonight. How can a man that was so good do something that's so bad? Adultery, deceit, murder. That's David, the man after God's own heart. Wow. We look at that, we all look. If we, we, if we only took that slice of his life, and God said, here's a man after my own heart. And then we read the story of him committing adultery and murdering her husband. We say, well, he's not a Christian. But that's tonight. And then I was thinking this. How else do we get ready for Jesus to come? Well, I, I was thinking that a lot of times Christians are good. They, they don't have any spiritual spinach. We need spiritual spinach. What's that? We, we need to be in the scriptures. I mean, if you're just listening to me, and worse yet, if the, if the message is boring, it could be this one. I don't know. And you're really not getting anything out of it. And you're not reading your Bible, and you're getting nothing. So you have to be in the scriptures. It's amazing how much time we can spend online, on our phones, watching television, seeing movies, and dedicate as Christians so little time towards something that will feed our soul and our spirit. But then also, if we want to be ready to see the Lord, face the Lord, I was thinking that we need to be ready to give. 1 Timothy 6.18 says, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Romans 12, 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Are we givers? I know people, you get hung up on tithing. <coughs> God's not hung up on tithing yet. Some people are hung up on tithing. You know what God's hung up on? I've given you everything. Will you give something back to me? Mm -hmm. We don't just have giving hearts. Give to the Lord through the church, but give to other things outside the church. If you see somebody with a need, help them. If you see a cause that you're interested in, give to it. Next week, we're taking an offering up from the batteries. You say, well, that's What's a battery? Hey, there's a radio station broadcasting the gospel message into the jungles of Africa. I'm not sure it's a jungle there, but anyway. So it's a good thing. And then I think we need to be ready to forgive. I know some Christians that are harbored grudges. They hate their brothers or sisters. Psalm 86, 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy, and a lot of mercy, unto all them that call upon you. So God forgave us, the New Testament, I should use that quote, that we ought to be willing to forgive others as God forgave us for Christ's sake, for Jesus' sake. We don't forgive others for Jesus' sake. And then I think we need to be ready to give an answer, ready to preach, ready to share our faith, if you will. 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord, set the Lord apart in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man, every woman, every person, every kid that asks you the reason of the hope that is in you. Are you living in such a way that people see the hope that's in you? Or do you walk around like, oh man, I don't know. Uh, things are just tough, it's terrible, it's hard. No, people want to see the hope that's in you. Life might stink right now, 
That's a theological term, stink. It, you might have financial problems, you might have health problems, you might have relationship problems, you might have family problems, but you know what? You still look into the Lord, Lord, you know all my problems. You've lived through probably all of them. So Lord, I'm just looking to you. I'm keeping my eyes on you. Someday we're going to pass through the valley of the shadow of death. I trust your eyes will be on the Lord then. I remember when my mom said, it, it kind of shocked me because I didn't think she realized this, but I was uh, in her hospital room, um, and the woman next, next to her, um, I, I was saying hi to and talking to her, and uh, I went there because for some odd reason she said something, gave me the impression she was a Christian. And so I went over there and I, I was talking to her for a moment and she said something about a poem uh, that she wrote about the Lord. And, and of course she was old and I think she was dying as well. And I said, well, can you tell me that poem? And this woman, she was in at least her 80s or 90s, uh, quoted this poem that she had written many years prior to that. And I thought, that's awesome. This woman at her age is remembering something that keeps her heart and mind focused on the Lord. And then my mom, I went back to my mom, and she said, why did you go over and talk to that woman? And I said, well, I thought she was Christian and went over to say hi, you know, that kind of thing. And she got a phone call from Harold, remember Harold? That's the guy that rented a room and eventually took over the whole house, but, um, She's talking to him and she says, I am dying. Now, that kind of shocked me because mom was just going to go through surgery on Monday, it's Friday, on Monday, and I was going home for the weekend and go back to be with her for that surgery, through that surgery. And she says, I'm dying. And sure enough, they called that weekend and said, your mom passed away. And it's like, how could she pass away? I mean, she seemed like, okay. Uh, they scheduled the surgery. So I was kind of shocked. But we need to be ready to face the Lord. But we need to be ready to tell others about the Lord as well. Romans 1.15 says this, So as much as in me is, Paul said, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So the question is, are you ready for Christmas? Have you got all your food ready? Are you ready for the family? Invitations given, you're ready. Everybody's going to come over. So you invited people, or they know because it's your family members, that the invitation is, it might not have been spoken, it's just understood that we're going to somebody's house for Christmas. Just understood. Well, I just want to encourage you and say this. Turn to Matthew 22. And verse number four. Jesus gives a parable of the kingdom of heaven. He says it's like a marriage with the son. And in verse number four, he said, again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden or invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My ox and my fatlings are killed, and all things are what? Ready. Ready. Come unto the marriage. So God is giving the world an invitation. I want you to be married as the church, as it were, to my son. There's a marriage feast that's going to take place. There's going to be a coming together, a consummation of the church with the bridegroom, the bride with the bridegroom someday. So God is inviting people, bidding us to come. So God is ready to receive us. Are you ready to receive Christ? Number two, God's ready to forgive. Psalm 86, 5, for you, Lord, you're good and ready to forgive. God's ready to forgive. And last of all, Matthew chapter 25, go back to 25, and verse number 10. So now he's talking 
about being ready, and he gives another parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. Look at verse number 10. And while they, that is the foolish virgins, went to buy the bridegroom, what? Came, and they that were, what? Ready, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. There's a woman, true story, who is buried under a 150-year-old oak tree in Louisiana. Huge tree. Maybe it's still there, I don't know. It's in a cemetery of an Episcopal church. And in accordance with the woman's instructions, there's only one word carved on her headstone. No dates, no birth, no death, no name. One word. What do you think the word is? 